This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, in chapter 19, we turn our attention back to the taxation of chargeable gains. Only this time, we're dealing with the taxation of those chargeable gains on companies, not on individuals. We saw back in chapters 12 to 14 how we dealt with the taxation of such gains on individuals, how we computed the gain or indeed allowable loss that arose on each individual disposal, what we then did with those gains, and of course, subsequently, we then established, having got the figure of taxable gains, how much CGT liability would be payable. Individuals paid capital gains tax on their capital gains. That is not the case with companies. Companies are not separately charged to CGT in relation to their gains. As you will know from Chapter 16, the introduction to the corporation tax computation, companies are taxed on their worldwide income and gains. So companies pay one taxation on their total profits. And those total profits include both the different sources of income, most notably trading, of course, there, but also any chargeable gains. And that is one of just a handful of essentially important differences from what you already know, or at least I hope you know, on the taxation of individuals to CGT. And what we're about to see, indeed, in the next three chapters, through here, 19, 20 and 21, as we look at the taxation of those chargeable gains for companies. And before we go into the detail here, firstly, in Chapter 19, what I want to do is to just point out to you, based on what you've already seen in CGT for individuals, what the key differences are between the taxation of gains on individuals and the taxation on companies. As we can see here, we're going to be dealing with corporation tax as opposed to CGT for individuals. Right, the differences. Companies do not get an annual exempt amount. Every individual against their income gets a personal allowance and against their chargeable gains gets an annual exempt amount. We don't have personal allowances. We do not have AEA for companies. For companies, we just establish what is their income, what is their or are their gains, and those are subjected in full to the rate of relevant rate of uh, corporation tax. Currently, as you know, some 19% there. So there's no AEA for companies. That's the bad news for companies. But the good news is that they continue to get something called indexation allowance. That is given to companies to reduce the gains for the effects of inflation from the date when they incurred the cost when they bought that particular chargeable asset through to what would otherwise have been the date of disposal. But, and you won't have to know about the history of this, but if earlier, the 31st of December 17, that will be earlier. We are no doubt going to deal with the taxation of chargeable gains arising on chargeable disposals of chargeable assets by the company, the chargeable person, that have arisen in the most recent times. Again, the chances are that we'll be looking at an accounting year end that ends either in 2020 or indeed 2021 there. We will be well past the 31st of December 17. Hence, the deduction that we make from our basic gain, as we'll see soon, the basic gains calculation is exactly the same as it was for an individual. What's our sale proceeds? What selling expenses have we incurred? Deduct those from the proceeds to get net proceeds and then deduct each individual allowable cost. The original cost plus any other expenses incurred of acquisition in acquiring that particular asset and then any enhancement expenditure that was also incurred following the date of acquisition through to the date of disposal. So we get that figure of gain. But what we're then able to do is to reduce further that chargeable gain by deduction known as indexation allowance. And as it says there in that note, what we're going to seek to do is to give a deduction 
known as indexation allowance, to take account of the effects of inflation as measured by our Retail Prices Index, or RPI, from the date of acquisition through to what used to be, before December 17 anyway, the date of disposal, but now given that we're likely to be dealing with disposals made for accounting periods, as I say, ended in 2020 or probably more likely 2021, on that basis, we're going to deal with indexation allowance up to that older date, the 31st of December 17. As we've already said, companies do not pay CGT, but simply include their chargeable gains within the corporation tax computation. As we've said, they do not pay CGT. Corporation tax is payable by a UK resident company based on its worldwide income and gains. So there is your basic difference in how we compute a gain. When we look at the details of indexation allowance, which represents your basic difference between what we did for individuals and what we now do for companies, we'll look at the basics of the indexation allowance. And thankfully, given the changes that have occurred over the years and therefore in your syllabus, the calculation now of indexation allowance is incredibly easy. If we simply have one figure of original cost, there was no enhancement expenditure, and we have a an acquisition before December 17, a disposal now in 2020 or 2021 there, which is obviously post December 17. All you'll be have to do is pick up what is given to you in the question. You don't have to work this out yourself. They give you what we call an indexation factor. Now, don't worry, we'll see notes on this in chapter 19 very soon. We're given an indexation factor and we apply that indexation factor to our allowable cost. And that number, the indexation factor, might be at a 0.125. You'll notice there I've gone to three decimal places, 0.125. And that would be multiplied by the allowable cost there. So if the allowable cost was, say, £100,000 times 0.125, if my own mental arithmetic doesn't defeat me here, that would be £12,500 as a deduction in terms of indexation allowance. They give you the indexation factors. That represents the movement in the RPI expressed as this three decimal place indexation factor from the date when the asset was purchased through to December 17, if that, as it will be, is earlier than the date of disposal. What will happen in an exam question, as again I say within the notes in chapter 19, is they're likely to give you, therefore, two indexation factors. Maybe the disposal took place in January 2021. So what happens is they give you an indexation factor from date of acquisition to December 17, and another one, date of acquisition, through all the way through to the date of disposal, January 2021. It is, as we've seen so many times before from examiners, enough a rope by which to hang yourself. Do not do that. You know that the latest date to which indexation allowance will be available is December, is December 2017. That is the index factor, indexation factor, therefore, for you to use. Apply that figure to the allowable cost that's the deduction from your basic gains calculation to give you your chargeable gain. But more of the detail later. In, also in chapter 19, once we've got that basic idea of how we calculate either a chargeable gain that I've spoken of so far, or indeed how we compute an allowable capital loss, what we'll also be looking at is the disposed upon specific asset that caused us, well, so much fun gave us so much fun, caused us so much trouble. I'll leave you to decide that one there. But dealing with the disposals of shares. And the problem that we had with shares is when we sell some of our shareholding in a particular other company, remember, this is a corporate owner of shares in that other company. When we sell some, but not all, and we'd acquired those shares at different costs over an extended period of time, then the issue is, which shares do we sell first 
in order that we can establish the precise allowable cost. There were rules that dealt with that back in chapter 13 for individuals. Don't bother going back to look at them because we have separate rules now that deal with companies. Because of the ish, certain issues like individuals get AEA and companies don't, being a main one, we've got different rules, different identification rules. So, sorry, but you're going to have to learn those rules. But again, thankfully, they're not too complicated. And with a bit of question practice, they are very, very straightforward indeed because it's an incredibly mechanical process. The techniques, the theory is simplistic. There's just, you are deemed to firstly sell these shares, followed by those shares, followed finally thirdly by these shares. It's mechanical. You either know the rules and you apply them, or you don't know the rules, so you can't apply them. Learn the rules, practice the rules, get it right. But again, it's gonna be an awful lot of calculator time and work involved there just as it was when dealing with individuals. So here, rules to identify which shares are being sold are different to those used for individuals. You may recall chapter 14 was a very long chapter for CGT dealing with reliefs, all the different CGT reliefs. And at the end of that chapter, I'm sure you remember it well, I said to you, that this was going to be much easier when it came to dealing with corporate tax. For there is only one of those five reliefs that we saw back then that we have to know about. And the only relief available to companies is rollover relief. The basis of which does not change. The system is the same. The only thing that is different is how we compute the chargeable gain for the company when it disposes of a qualifying business asset, usually a property, of course, there, when it disposes of that uh, qualifying business asset, that we have the ability to reduce the gain by indexation allowance that didn't exist for companies, uh, for individuals, I beg your pardon, does exist for companies only. Now, that simply creates a difference in the figure of gain. Once you've got the gain, and you've made the sale and you are then told about a uh, acquisition cost, usually on a replacement asset in relation to a property that has been sold, then the rules for rollover relief are exactly the same as for individuals. So that will make, we have a chapter dealing with the reliefs for companies, but it's just one relief, rollover relief, all the techniques of which you already know, it is simply practicing again those techniques, but remembering that we've got a deduct indexation allowance in computing a chargeable gain made by a company. So that's going to make life a whole lot easier there. Most of the other stuff that we see in chapter 20, we'll be dealing with various other scenarios, as we have seen before, in relation to individuals, where we deal with the disposals of things like chattels, tangible, movable property. There were special rules that dealt with chattels where one or both of the figures of sales proceeds and cost may have been below the £6,000 chattel exemption limit. Maybe one above, one below. So there were rules there that we had. Those rules are just the same as we see now for companies, except again that in computing any gain, at least, we take account of indexation allowance. We'll also deal with part disposals there. Same problem, I bought an asset and now I sell a part of that asset. It's usually land that one deals with here, but when you sell some of an asset that you bought as a complete entity, you have a problem because now on sale, I know what the sale proceeds are, but what I need to know is the allowable cost of the bit being sold. I'm not selling everything I bought. So I've got to do some apportionment, therefore, of the original total cost of the entire asset to get an allowable cost for the bit that I am now selling. Those two areas, dealing with chattels and dealing with their part disposals, come up in chapter 20. At the end of this chapter, chapter 19, having dealt with 
the basic computation of gains or losses for companies. Having applied then these rules when dealing with shares, share disposals, once we've dealt with that, I'll remind you that before we look at chapter 20, that you go back and remind yourself about the specific rules for dealing with the disposal of chattels, for dealing with part disposals of assets. And that's going to help us when it comes to uh, chapter 20. But in chapter 20, we have basically the one new component that I didn't introduce to you previously in the CGT chapters of 12 to 14, because it's usually tested in the context of a company, but could still be tested for an individual. The only difference basically being in gains terms, you have indexation allowance for companies and you don't have that for individuals. It's the treatment of assets damaged, lost or destroyed. That is dealt with in chapter 20, but these rules would also apply to CGT for individuals. So instead of dealing with all of the issues in chapters 12 to 14, I left this particular one dealing with these assets damaged, lost or destroyed. Now for the corporate tax chapters that deal with chargeable gains, to be precise, chapter 20 there. But first of all, what we've got to do, of course, is have a look at the content of chapter 19, specifically to begin with the things that I've already said about what are companies charged to tax on and how do we compute that gain for companies taking account of this new component, this extra deduction available for companies known as indexation allowance. So what have we got? We saw in chapter 16 on our introduction to corporation tax that companies pay corporation tax on their chargeable gains. To be precise, on their worldwide income and gains, they do not pay CGT. But just like an individual will only do any calculation when we deal with a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. And yes, the company is a chargeable person. It is liable on its worldwide gains. We'll see in a moment what the most likely chargeable assets are for a corporate disposal. And yes, when a company disposes of an asset, they're not going to give it away as an individual might do. You might remember that issue of disposal consideration where it isn't necessarily any actual proceeds. If there are any, it may be open market value, whether wherever a donor made some element of gift outright or sale at under value to a donee. Companies aren't giving anything away here. So what we'll have is that when you have a chargeable disposal, you're basically dealing with sales proceeds as the disposal consideration. But where market value will come into play is if, for example, an asset is lost or destroyed, possibly even damaged, where market value usually some sort of insurance proceeds comes into play here in substitution for any actual sales proceeds because it wasn't sold, it was lost or destroyed. The question then is, was it insured? Whatever were the proceeds in relation to that insurance, they will go in in computing your capital gain. It will still represent a chargeable disposal. As we've already said, a UK resident company is liable on its worldwide gains and as we've already made mention of may dispose of that asset not simply through sale but through the loss or destruction of the asset. We've already spoken of but not seen how to exactly at least compute indexation allowance but we've said and we're going to see in note 1.2 below that the calculation of the gain contains this one new component which wasn't applicable to individuals. Companies will be given a deduction from the gain to remove the effect of inflation. Inflation from certainly when the asset was purchased through to either when it's sold or more likely you will be dealing with up to date disposals for year ends in 2020 or 2021, maybe even 2022 once we get through to later exams within this next round of examinations anyway. And therefore, it's probably December 17. It is going to be a simple calculation 
as long as you can establish allowable cost, they'll give you the indexation factor. You pick it up, put it through your calculator, times the factor by the cost, and that's your deduction of indexation allowance. It's very, very easy. The deduction, as we said, only goes through to December 17. So deduction is known as indexation allowance, but clearly will not be available if the asset was purchased post December 17. Indexation only goes up to December 17, at which point it was frozen. So anything bought since then and now sold, there's no indexation allowance on it because there was no inflation up to as a latest date, December 17. What are chargeable assets? A definition again you know well. All assets are chargeable unless they are specifically exempt. Exempt assets, as it says there, a more complete list is available to you back in chapter 12, where we got introduced to, again, the concept of what are chargeable assets or assets unless they're specifically exempted there. But the ones that we're most likely to deal with and see within a corporate tax exercise are main exempt assets that a company may dispose of would be motor vehicles, qualifying corporate bonds, i.e. corporate loan stock, loan stock debentures, and certain chattels, which chattels are exempt, those bought and sold for less than £6,000 or indeed wasting chattels, as they are known. Wasting means a life of not more than 50 years. The main chargeable assets that a company will dispose of will be shares, land and buildings, and plant and machinery. They're the big three that we're likely to see disposals of. Okay, occasionally you might have a chattel disposal. The typical one there is in the boardroom for the directors, there was this painting that hung upon the wall. And I don't know, maybe they've uh, got a conscience or something like that. And oh, they're in uh, hard times, but they've decided that the company that owns that particular painting should sell it. The painting is a chattel, and you've got to use your chattel rules, therefore, to compute any gain or loss that may have arisen on the disposal. But other than that, shares, you'll see that in this chapter, or land and buildings, or indeed plant and machinery. Note that, that on the disposal of plant and machinery, upon which capital allowances have been claimed, remember chapter 5, capital allowances here, there may be no capital loss. You bought for £100,000, you've sold it for £40,000 you've made a loss of £60,000 thereon. You will already, as a company, or indeed as an unincorporated trader, here though it's corporate tax, bought for 100, sold for 40. That £60,000 loss on the disposal of that asset, that has already been relieved within the capital allowance system, where you put 100,000 in, and you took 40,000 out of the capital allowances computation, leaving 60,000 therefore to be compensated for as the net cost of ownership of that item of plant or machinery. That net cost of 60,000 has been relieved within the capital allowances system. So you've had a deduction already for that in form of capital allowances. What have they done? They've reduced trading income you are not also going to get a reduction in any other capital gains by saying, oh, that's a capital loss. You, uh, again, sold it for 40, you bought it for 100. That's a capital loss of 60,000. No, it isn't. Assets that attract capital allowances there, you plant to machinery, basically, then you are not going to have a loss. It is, of course, incredibly unlikely that in real life that you'd be able to sell an item of plant to machinery for more than you bought it for. But if you did, then it would be just a normal, perfectly normal capital gains calculation, because yes, they're chargeable assets there. No capital loss arising as any loss has been relieved through the capital allowance system against, as we've said, trading profits. In the unlikely situation of selling such an asset for more than cost, a normal gains calculation will be performed. 
other than something new in the capital allowances system from Finance Act 2020. Other than with the adjustment required on the sale of a building where SBA has been claimed, as we saw back in Chapter 5, a long time ago now, but I hope you can recall. SBA, Structures and Buildings Allowance, that when you dispose of such a property, structures and buildings that has had structures and buildings allowance available on it, when you dispose of it, what we said was that there'd be no balancing adjustment within the capital allowances system to deal with that disposal, but instead, in the capital gains calculation, because a property is going to be a chargeable asset. In that capital gains calculation, we would add to the sales proceeds the total amount of capital allowances that had been claimed in relation to our structures and buildings allowance. Again, if you can't recall that, go back, revisit the end of Chapter 5, where we look at SBA. Only after this, you'll be able to understand how we compute a chargeable gain rather more easily than you could have done back in Chapter 5, where we knew little or nothing about capital gains and their chargeability to tax. The basic calculation of gains and losses for companies. Disposal proceeds or market value going at the top. That value tends to be the insurance proceeds because we're not going to see a company giving something away as we could and very likely will do in terms of an individual in an examination question. But away from the disposal proceeds, we take our selling expenses to give us net proceeds. We then take away all of our allowable costs. An original cost that we had incurred, plus any other expenses incurred in relation to that acquisition, like legal expenses, for example. And then any other additional enhancement expenditure that we have incurred, from when we bought it through to the date of disposal. Now that would, for an individual, give you a chargeable gain or allowable loss. That would be it. But not now for individuals, at least so far as gains are concerned. As we'll see on the separate note in a moment for indexation allowance, what it cannot do is to turn an unindexed gain at that point into a loss. The best that indexation allowance can do for you in these circumstances is to reduce what was an unindexed gain down to nil. It cannot turn a gain into a loss, nor indeed can it increase a capital loss that has arisen. All that indexation allowance can do is to reduce gains down to a minimum zero figure. They do not create or increase losses. And that will bring us down to, let's assume anyway, a chargeable gain. So it's all about that indexation allowance. Most, it might look a little bit forbidding, all this note here, but actually most of this is just putting where we are today in context. Because the calculation that you do today at the end of all of this is incredibly simple. As we have already said, you are given an indexation factor. You may have to choose from different indexation factors, which is the right indexation factor. But you'll be given the figure to use. And all you've got to do is to apply it to the allowable cost incurred by the company in relation to that asset. Multiply the cost by the indexation factor. As long as you can work a calculator, there isn't a problem here. But let's just go through what is the background to it, and then we'll deal with an example and get a calculation under our belts. OK, as we say for companies only, not individuals, the increase in value of an asset due to inflation, but only up to December 17, is not taxable. This increase is removed from the gain by way of, we've just seen the deduction, of indexation allowance. Companies had always, had always been entitled to an indexation allowance computed from the month of acquisition through to the month of disposal of an asset. 
and was calculated by reference to the movement in the RPI, the Retail Prices Index. Again, you don't need to know this. And what you do need to know, you apply that indexation factor to the cost of the asset. The increase in the RPI is expressed as a decimal rounded to three decimal places, which indexation factor is then applied to the cost of the asset to compute the indexation allowance. If you can hear her noise there in the background, that is my printer. That is something that I sent to the printer about 40 minutes ago. It's very slow Wi-Fi here, very slow Wi-Fi. Not to worry. OK, then applied the cost to compute the indexation allowance. Indexation allowance has now been frozen at December 17, so it will now be given to the date of disposal, or much more likely to us, December 17, if that is as it will be before the date of disposal. Our syllabus no longer includes the requirement to calculate the indexation factor, which once it did, such that indexation probably factors will now be provided in the question and the student needs simply to choose and apply the correct one. The most likely situ situation, as we've said, is being a disposal made after December 17 and in indexation factors being as supplied as they will be from the date of acquisition, but to both the date that we will use, December 17, and also the later date of disposal, wherever it is in the year ended, uh, I don't know, December 20, December 21, whatever it might be there. That is clearly post-December 17. We freeze indexation at December 17. That is the indexation factor to use. As we already mentioned, this deduction, the indexation allowance, cannot increase or create a loss. What you may have to do, however, is more than one calculation of indexation allowance. It's not more difficult, it's just more time consuming. You're doing the same thing maybe twice rather than once. Why might there be an additional indexation allowance to deal with? The reason being, if allowable enhancement expenditure is incurred after acquisition, then it will require a separate indexation factor to be applied from the month the expenditure is incurred. So you, what you will also be given would be not just an indexation factor from date acquired through to December 17, and probably also the later date of disposal. That indexation factor in December 17, you would apply to the original allowable cost. But then you're also told about enhancement expenditure. It was uh, a property that had been purchased. And then at a later date, probably before December 17, enhancement expenditure was incurred. Improvement, capital expenditure incurred. And that must be separately indexed with its own indexation factor from the date incurred through to December 17. If, of course, any expenditure was incurred post-December 17, then there is no indexation allowance available because it was frozen at December 17 there. We've got then example one, where we've got to calculate the chargeable gain arising on the disposal of the asset. We want to find out, of course, when the asset was sold the asset is sold for £100,000 on the 2nd of October 2021. So there's our sale proceeds, £100,000. At the point of sale, did we incur any selling expenses? Yes, we did. Incidental costs of sale, £1,000. Well, there's your starting point. You've got your proceeds, you've got your selling expenses, you get your net proceeds. Away from which we need to deduct our allowable cost, or indeed, costs. So what are we told there? A company bought an asset on the 6th of June 86 at a cost of £20,000. Enhancement expenditure of 6000 was incurred on the 16th of August 1990. So we've got original acquisition cost, £20,000, June 86. 
Now we know that in calculating the unindexed gain, we're going to deduct all of any original and also any enhancement expenditure costs that we've incurred. But it also means, as we've just suggested, that if we've got a separate and of course what will always be a later date in relation to the enhancement expenditure, then it can only be indexed from the date that it was incurred. Again, probably through to December 17, as that's the latest date you can go to. So what have we got? We're given indexation factors here where we've got, we know that our indexation factor will not here go to the date of disposal because that is after, it's very much after December 17. So the ones that we want are the ones to December 17. Those are these numbers. The original cost was incurred in June 86 and the indexation factor through to December 17 was 1.706. So when you do your indexation allowance, it will be 1.706 times your original cost of £20,000. The enhancement expenditure, August 1990. August 90 to December 17, obviously a smaller indexation factor. That indexation allowance must be separately computed 1.067 times what was its cost, the enhancement expenditure, was £6,000. So a simple exercise for you now to do. We know the proceeds, we know the selling expenses, you get your net proceeds. We know our original cost, our enhancement expenditure, deduct that total and get your unindexed gain deduct indexation allowance. There we go, indexation factors to either the date of disposal or, as it is going to be here earlier, December 17. And apply the indexation factors separately to the allowable cost and then any enhancement expenditure, if as here, it too was incurred pre-December 17. Get your indexation allowance computed, deducted. If that is still a gain, that will be the chargeable gain. If it had reduced an unindexed gain down to zero, it's not going to happen here. But if it went down below zero to a bracketed, a negative figure, we don't get a loss. Indexation allowance cannot serve to either increase or create a loss. So what I'd like you to do here, therefore, is just finish that off. Again, I'm not too worried about your presentation standards here, as you're not going to be worried either in what will be an objective testing question. It's simply got to be good enough how you lay out your answer to give you the correct answer and to avoid making silly errors by shortcutting. We must do the job properly. But it is a race against time, so you don't have to worry about, again, this will be music to your ears, no doubt, you don't have to worry in your notes and workings here about being neat and tidy. The only time you've got to do it and express it properly is in answering section C questions, which is unlikely to be covering this particular issue in all honesty. It's possible, again, there's going to be a 15 mark corporate tax question. It's perfectly possible that that will include a chargeable gain but more likely in section A or section B. Okay, over to you guys, so pause now if you'd be so kind and have a little go at example one. And I'll see you again when you've done that and we'll look at the answer together. Okay, well, hopefully nothing surprising here when you came to exercise yourselves in, uh, on this example, nor as you now look at the model answer. We knew the proceeds and the selling expenses to give you your net proceeds. We knew we had both original and enhancement expenditure and therefore the total was deducted to give us what for an individual would have been the chargeable gain but for us now in corporate taxes the unindexed gain. Again so far as you're concerned unless you're dealing with a section C question none of the narrative down the left hand side is going to be written out. You know what you're doing on your working paper. 
it's a hundred thousand less a thousand is 99 less allowable costs 26 therefore the gain is 73,000 pounds I have got to calculate the indexation allowance on original costs separate to the enhancement expenditure you're given the indexation factors pick the right ones to use only as far as December 17 whereas here you will discover that the disposal date is later than December 17. Get your total of indexation allowance deducted. That is still a gain, so that is the chargeable gain computed. Remembering here that this deduction could not create a loss. If that figure of gain were less than the £40,522 worth of indexation allowance, you would simply show nil as your resultant gain. The only time you'll have an allowable capital loss is at this point when you do this calculation. If you have indeed sold with net proceeds less than your allowable costs, that is your allowable loss. It cannot be increased, it cannot be created by the deduction of indexation allowance. OK, plenty for you to be working through, therefore, now, before next time. And also before next time, what I'd like you to do is just have a little read through, just spend just a few minutes reading through and thinking about what is said there, because there isn't anything there that should cause you any problems. I'll, of course, quickly talk you through that. But again, I should by then, next time, be preaching to the converted. What would also be a worthwhile exercise for you is to read through the first part here, this section three note, on what will be the share matching rules for companies. I said at the beginning of this particular lecture what the issue was with shares. Same problem as we had for individuals. I'm now selling some, but not all, of my shareholding in a particular company. I know what I've sold these shares for. What I don't know is the cost. The cost is the problem because the shares that I'm now selling, I had not originally acquired in one go, one purchase at one figure of cost. But what I did was to have acquired them over a period of time. And what it means is when we sell shares in this company, we ourselves a company, sell shares in this other company, the first problem you have to deal with is determining out of that list of acquisitions, how do I organise them to know which of these shares sold, which of these shares, sorry, acquired, are now being sold? I've got to get those identification rules. Now, I don't need you to practice these before next time. I simply need you to familiarise yourself with this note. So that as I, when I talk it through with you next time, it won't be you reading it for the very first time. You'll have a time to look at it, to think about it, and therefore we should be able to move on rather more quickly and rather more successfully than if you are indeed looking at it for the first time when next we meet. Well, I look forward to that, where we'll be able to uh, deal with most of the issues pertaining to share disposals. See you then.